really, well, I'm Randy Whitehouse, Dean of the College of Public Health. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all here uh, to the lecture in the Leading Voices in Public Health lecture series, which is also the Justice, Health, and Humanities lecture, which we co-sponsor with the Department of Philosophy and Humanities. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Martinez Garcia about three years ago when he was speaking at a conference on women and children in disasters, and I happened to be at that conference. And there were a lot of great speakers there. But Daniel was one of those rare people who had both the academic preparation and the real world perspective. He's a physician who trained at the National University of Mexico, also did a master's in public health from uh, someone called Johns Hopkins. <laughs> we're joking our folks in video land. But as you can see in the flyer, he's worked in over a dozen countries to, it really reads like some of the most hardest hit war zones in the world. And through that has become a real expert on the challenges of children in disasters. But I, one of the points that he will undoubtedly make, and I think you all will recognize this, is that this isn't a pediatric lecture. The, the impact of disasters on children is a pediatric health issue. But really, it's the underlying factors, the social conditions in which people live that make a disaster either short-term or prolonged. And I think his perspective on that has been eye-opening for me as well. And that's why this is a Justice, Health, and Humanities lecture. Uh, just in, in closing, um, some of you know that Daniel agreed to come up last semester and through some logistical issues, couldn't make it. And he said, well, I'll come back. And in order for him to be here today, he had to fly up from Panama City, Panama, not Florida. <laughs> uh, came in last Friday, spent the weekend here. Um, and all the more impressive, because I've learned he has a six-month daughter at home that he hasn't seen for quite a while. Uh, but I think you're in for a real treat tonight. So please join me in welcoming Daniel. Thank you. So I'm going to do it off stage because I think it's nicer. And I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, it has taken quite some time. And I, I hope you would uh, uh, apologize if I make some, some mistakes in my English. I still mix some words of Spanish or French. And uh, um, also that you appreciate that whatever I would say today, I like much more di a dialogue than this where I'm here, which I don't believe. So I'm not anybody or to talk from a perspective that I know something that you don't know. What I'm trying to share is some of the things that I've seen from my own little human perspective. And my, that might resonate in some of you, maybe not. And with the humility that I'm not trying to convince you uh, to change. I just uh, want to contribute to that, a dialogue. So I'm, I'm actually much more interested in what will happen after with some of maybe exchange with some of you uh, that has already happened and that would continue because that's what we are here for and trying to, to engage more in a, in a human dialogue. So quick thing from the main organization that I work on, um, uh, which is on the, because I work in a health organization and in an education organization. On the health one in Doctors Without Borders, we've been already around almost 50 years. It has a larger reputation. We are a, a bigger independent emergency organization. And we right now have closer to 40,000 employees in around uh, closer to 460 projects in more than 70 countries. So it's a large organization, and historically we, we show when we do presentations that we work in areas with lack of access to healthcare, in areas in conflict, in areas where there's been disasters and epidemics. But to be fair, three quarters of the areas where we work are not so sexy. They are protracted, forgotten, crisis that doesn't make the headlines. That's the reality. What is particularly that I really always 
thought is the core of some of the things is the principle of the organization, which are independence, impartiality, and neutrality. And you would see why many humanitarian organizations, we share at least the, the concept of neutrality as a key element, because it's built under what you could actually do in some of these settings. Without that concept, you can't be a humanitarian actor. And I will tell you what is my perspective about how sometimes we have confused what is humanitarian aid. Sometimes we see military forces bringing humanitarian aid that is definitely not, cannot be humanitarian aid because by definition it has to be neutral. And the other element that is important because Doctors Without Borders was founded by former doctors and journalists that were working with the Red Cross and saw things, and the Red Cross also bears these elements, very similar. But the Red Cross works with a lot of, with the local governments and authorities, and one of the agreements that they have is of confidentiality. And that allows them and grants them a lot of access. The problem is when they see something like a violation of human rights, they are not authorized to speak out. And that caused a big ethical dilemma in some of our colleagues that then created an organization that, that basically was same principles with the extra capacity of speaking out. So speaking out is very nice because it allows you to, but it also, it allows you to, to, to say uh, what you're seeing as a direct witness of something that is happening. The problem with speaking out is that these speaking out might remove you from the access that you were having. And that is something that we might discuss with some of you after. You see a genocide, you speak out, and then you're kicked out of the country. Was it helpful or not? I don't have a, an answer, but that gives you a different perspective. In Syria, for example, we have speaked out against what we saw as use of chemical weapons. We have not been authorized to enter into gov Syria government control areas, but the Red Cross has. On the other hand, we are able to enter Kurdish control areas and the Red Cross hasn't, so it balanced in terms of access. I'm going to enter a little bit philosophical, but it's important because humanitarian, the principle that I'm trying to talk here, has actually a very um, political and philosophical dimension. Very concrete, we will see, very concrete, in, based on reality, but rooted in an agreement of a principle. So humanitarian, what is that? The action is never sacrificing a human being to a purpose. You need to come to the roots of understanding the humanity in the other. So another quote is, this is an action that cannot condition itself on the future or the past, but only the present suffering of the person in front of us. It's interesting to see the difference sometimes with public health. In public health, you think of the larger good for the majority, which is, it's, uh, it's, but it's very interesting, but it, that doesn't mean, for example, you have to choose, somebody here is sick, but with the same money that you would use to treat that person today, you could treat 10 other people. So in terms of cost, cost effectiveness, in terms even of total good, treating one person might not be the most ethical thing. It, from a humanitarian point of view, we cannot just neglect and just say we're not seeing that human suffering in that moment. So we would not enter into considerations of how many others I could save when I am, and I use the word, when I, when, if I ever use the word saving, I put it on, on brackets. When I am interacting with another human being and contributing to a curative action, I would only interact with that person and not think of other underlying elements. So sometimes my organization is referred as a charity. We are not a charity. Charity implies again this thing, this top-down patronizing neocolonial thing where I'm going to come as a white doctor, not really white, but uh, to help the little uh, poor dying kids. That is Incorrect. I'm not, and what I do, I don't consider that charity. I consider that an action with other human beings where I'm going to learn from them, they're going to learn from me in the terms of our capacities. So I'm trying to use humanitarian as a verb to be more inclusive. 
avoiding ownership to one institution. That's why I don't bear a a allegiance to a specific institution. And I'm, I'm speaking here just on my own terms. So we're trying to provide a basic level of humanity to a person or to people suffering. And that's it. We're not trying to save the world. We're not trying uh, to, to change the system. Unfortunately, those are the limitations of that. And then something that I've learned when I did my training from medicine, pediatrics to public health, and then going back to more disaster medicine and humanitarian, all of these terms are confusing. What is what and what does it link? So uh, global health, international health, public health have different focus and you could read the myriad of publications about the scope, the magnitude of the scope of the populations that you're interacting. What is interesting that it goes from the individual, the family, the community, humanitarian health that sometimes is seen as a subfield of either global health or public health, what it introduced? It introduced the political dimension, which is the part that, uh, that I'm going to talk. So humanitarian action was also defined in one moment as a temporary thing. And like the humanitarian response was the early response, the emergent uh, actions that you did in the first weeks, just post Katrina or the first week after a tsunami. But that is, again, what I tell you. The reality is that the majority of humanitarian contexts are in protracted crisis, are in long-term chronic disasters. The Sahelian chronic yearly malaria epidemics, the recurrent yearly Ebola outbreaks. Nothing has really changed. So this framework that you see of humanitarian acting at the beginning, and then you have the recovery, you stabilize, the peace building, the development. This mix, for me, that has been completely, uh, needs to be abandoned. There isn't this difference. There shouldn't be. You could have a humanitarian context or a humanitarian crisis that has been ongoing for 50 years or 100 years. It doesn't change. What it is important is this political element. So the humanitarian space, Humanitarian space, again, a human construction, an agreement that when we are at war, there are some rules. And when there is wounded, I'm fighting against you, and now there's wounded in the middle, you're going to, we are going to, both of us, allow a third party, that is neither you nor me, to pick the wounded. And we are not going to shoot that person. That was the political agreement that happened after Second World War, that it happened actually historically after some wars in Europe that lead to the creation of the International Red Cross. It was an agreement of neutrality from a third party, of a space, a safe space, just to take care of the wounded or just to, to perform medical acts that were beneficial to all parties of the conflict. It's a complete theoretical agreement but it was the baseline for the creation of the humanitarian world. Once this safe space, so this image shows you a hospital of Doctors Without Borders in the city of Kunduz in Afghanistan. This hospital, which GPS coordinates were given directly to the US and Afghanistan military, was directly targeted by a US airplane and not only was rounded and bombed directly, but the plane continued circling and shooting every person that was leaving the compound in flames. Nobody armed was in there, and we can speak out on that because we, had, we lost colleagues in that event and we had actually testimony of victims. In that moment, the, political, the humanitarian space was destroyed. The actors that were supposed to ensure that our space was protected. In that hospital, we were treating both Afghanistan military and also Taliban uh, fighters. So it was a neutral place that was helping both sides, but our presence was felt as an obstacle uh, for the authorities, and it was labeled as to the date as a mistake. It was a violation of international human rights, a violation of the rules of war, and the humanitarian space was destroyed. 
since that attack, because there were no consequences, the number of events of attacks against humanitarian medical facilities has skyrocket, skyrocketed. And there are hundreds of facilities in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Iraq that have been targeted. Because once somebody breaks the rules, and again, they're theoretical, they're completely here. Once somebody breaks it, the others are like, what are we going to respect this? So humanitarian action needs this space. It's the only way we can act. So it enters the other dimension, it reaches the particular settings. The particular settings where we work are, by definition, dangerous places where they, they could actually, if there wasn't these theoretical rules, we could actually become victims of the conflict. So this humanitarian space that is theoretical is shrinking. Right now, we feel pressures because there seems that there is not any more rules that allows uh, this organization to feel that they're protected and can act in these areas where there's been a total collapse of the rule of law. Sorry if I'm depressing anybody. <laughs> uh, so going into another topic, or similar, uh, is the link that there is in one of these elements that is, that is linked sometimes to disasters. And we talk about, and with some of you have discussed this, about the term natural disasters. No? First, there is a natural disasters. Most disasters are man-made. And the conditions that cause a disaster is not the geological phenomenon, an earthquake or a tsunami. That's a, just a phenomenon. If there wasn't any human being there, there wouldn't be uh, a disaster. So where I come from in Mexico City, where there's been earthquakes repetitively, the cause of the disasters that we face are the fact that they build a city in the middle of a lake. And, uh, and that has not changed. So there's going to be more and more disasters. What they can work is in the capacity to adapt or the resilience of this place. But what we've seen in the world is a lot of areas with a lot of vulnerability, which is the underlying conditions, and then you have the risk of the elements that, that can occur. It could be geological events, so it could be political or social events. And we see this disbalance where we have the areas with the highest risk that normally are poor countries. Uh, and, but this is the areas where normally you have these repetition of events. So by removing the term natural, we want to stop uh, putting an external element that comes and uh, cause a disaster in Haiti or cause uh, an epidemic in Yemen. This is something that is un unfortunately not external to the underlying situation in a place. The interesting element that is happening today is that now rich countries are being affected. And we feel that that might change the dynamic because when a disaster is hitting now, Japan or the US, the economical consequences are rising to a level that the world might become uninsurable in one moment. So maybe there is we're going to change the dynamic of, of our perspective uh, towards disasters. So now I'm going to go to the core of the topic, humanitarian pediatrics. And I've been spending the last 10 years trying to, to, to find this because I try in part of my work as a, as a researcher in, in this field to, to, to show all the others pediatricians, the particularities of my field, and then you try to go to different conference or different settings and try to bring also uh, other researchers to be interested in our field, and it's not working. Because when we come from the perspective of global pediatrics or public health, uh, it's not working once there is not an understanding that the setting is completely different. And if you don't change that perspective, it's going to be very, very difficult to actually be able to come with solutions that are useful in these settings. You need to understand what are the political differences, the geographical differences, the economical differences of these settings to be able to adapt solutions. Uh, the first element, for example, is that pediatrics, I've realized that not everybody has the same definition of what a child is. And that already changed the policies that you can make. So I was trained uh, for children below around 19, 20, which is very similar to what you could have in the United States or Canada. Sometimes we can accept that here we could even go up to 25. That is clear North America perspective. Even if you go to Central America and South America, 
the definition is probably closer to 1718. Then you switch to Europe, and my colleagues in Europe, they don't treat teenagers. Pediatrics ends up at 14 years, 11 months. Uh, and a child, 15, goes to an adult hospital. And, that's, uh, and then if you go to some of the areas where I've been, uh, where some of you have been actually, for example, in Iraq, uh, the definition is interesting because for boys, it could be up to 15, but for girls, it's top at 12. At 12, girls go to adult war, boys can stay up to 15. And then if you go to some areas in, um, in uh, East and Central Africa, sometimes the importance of the element of, ch of, of, child, of, of what a child is, is more of the, the social representation of when are they allowed not to work and when are they allowed to get access to healthcare without cost, and most of them is just below five. After five, they are almost requested to have the same uh, responsibilities as, as, as older persons or older children. So most of our pediatric hospitals in Niger, in Chad, in Central African Republic, our pediatric ward stops at age five. At age six, we send these children to the adult ward. So we cheat a lot. And we keep some of these kids, but we can't. I mean, because there is an economical incentive. The system treats children for free. So the definition is super important because if you say, yeah, let's change it, there is a big uh, uh, economical incentive to keep it as limited as possible. So we're not even talking about the same thing. And that needs to be context dependent. So when you try to advocate for adolescent health, depending on the context, you're either going to be dealing with a Soci medical societies that deal with adults or with pediatric societies. And they have a different perspective of the needs, of the vulnerability uh, of, of that specific population. But in my work, I, because I frequently meet with people in the world of public health, they tell me, but the world is getting better. You know, like, look at the trends. Look at the amazing trends of reduction in child mortality in the last 30 years. It is the largest reduction of mortality in the history of humanity. The population has increased from around um, 4 billion by the mid 80s to the population that we are today close to uh, a little bit more than 7 billion people. One of the largest increase of population in the history of humanity, I think the, the, the largest. And at the same time, in absolute numbers, we have seen a reduction uh, from almost 13 million children dying every year to uh, less than six. There's never been such a reduction in, if you quantify mortality as a proxy of happiness, such a, an increase in happiness or a reduction of suffering, depending on your perspective. Uh, that, would, that should make us feel happy. The problem of this is that in my practice, in 13 years, the places I visited in Niger, border with Nigeria, our mortality rate in our program has been the same in the past uh, 15 years. It hasn't really changed. Because average, it has been driven by the economical development of, of, um, of countries like China, like India, uh, like Pakistan, like Mexico, like Brazil. And those countries are so massively uh, important for the big demographics that when you actually see what's happening in humanitarian context, it, ha it has almost not, not reduced or, or the, the, the rate of reduction is much slower. So the big rates doesn't allow you to see that actually, if you see this as a public health expert, you think this is working, we need to continue doing what we're doing here and apply it and just reach closer to the place. But it's not working everywhere. And in some of these places, because we keep this big frame of the low hanging fruits, simple solutions, we're never gonna be able to reduce the pockets of measles, the cholera cases, the neonatal tetanus cases that we still have in Central African Republic, the 50% of deliveries that still occur at home and they're not coming, because we keep this broader public health perspective. We need to adapt that. And this is the other frame that I have 
with some of my colleagues of global health, of public health. They see this as a path towards success. It is working. This is the reality to the left of what we're facing. Everything is challenging from access, from security, from energy, every, even ourselves. We're coming now with solutions in tablets or smartphones. And then the reality check is we don't have access to even electricity or internet in most of these places. So tablets are not working. So we need to change that, that framework to think that we're going to solve and be able to actually impact the life of children in this humanitarian context just by applying a framework that is working in China or in India. So this is a real example of what I'm telling you. And I'm not proud of what I'm going to share. This is uh, the yearly admission in a project that we have in the southeast part of Niger, border uh, northern country from Nigeria, so French-speaking country, Hausa region. And we see the, the graphics that you see are from 2015 to 2018, the rates of admissions to one pediatric hospital. Again, a hospital that only sees under five children. So you could see that every year, almost at the same time of the year, with the beginning of the rainy season, which also coincides to the end um, of all the, sh the, the storages of food that they have, you have a big increase of malnutrition because all their food supplies have ended. And now you have the rainy season and malaria cases start to increase. So every year we see a very clear increase of admissions, malnourish and malaria cases. And that creates the idea of a peak season. Peak season that here, let's say, in, in North America, we would see it in winter, with the peak season being when you have an increase of respiratory uh, or gastrointestinal infections linked to winter or sometimes in spring. Here you clearly see it at the beginning of the rainy season. Uh, and you could actually predict it. So the humanitarian actors, we predict these things. We just map it. We see the rain patterns. We see the stocks of food and we follow the prices and we prepare. We do disaster preparedness and we intervene when the indicators start to rise. Do we change the underlying conditions? No. Because for many years we've thought that humanitarians and development, they don't match. So what we're doing every year is just to prepare to treat the disaster when we know that it's going to happen. And I feel a little bit ashamed to show that because we know what is happening and we could intervene much more and after 20 years we could have worked to resolve with the local communities to improve the local capacity and to maybe work on the underlying economical, social, agricultural conditions that are causing this. Just preparing, there is a big field of specialists that are just working on disaster preparedness, which is very interesting but it has kind of a of uh, an underlying cynical element, which is almost like firefighters. And we know that the solution to fires are not just to put more firefighters. We should do prevention of fires. And in the world of disasters, we do a lot of disaster preparedness. And look at the mortality. In one hospital, just to give you, for some of you that are not physicians, in my entire training of medicine, plus pediatrics, including rural service in Mexico, poorest areas, I don't think I saw more than 50 people dying in 12 years. And I remember I used to have a list of them. I knew their story. In one single hospital, we had more than 1,300 deaths. If you go into the figures, some weeks, weeks, we almost reach 100 deaths per week. Our peak was more than 20 in a day. Those are our teams exposed to that every day in just one project. And they were dying of <coughs> pneumonia, measles, severe malaria, anemia, septic shock, meningitis. As humans, we, I feel ashamed I'm not, uh, to have kids that are dying from this. Maybe one of them or some of them were dying of congenital cardiac conditions and some of them of leukemia and other things. But I can bet that I'm going to make around between 90 to 95% of the deaths were preventable. 
this is that today, with the wealth that we have, how can we still let this happen? So again, when we still see the big trend, this shouldn't exist. We shouldn't be presenting these figures. And we shouldn't expose our staff to these nightmares. So that's what I'm trying to, to do. Like, what do I do? Like, I'm seeing this. The, the way I could reduce this mortality would be to increase resources in this area, creating intensive care units, or should I invest in the community approach? Should I take the low-hanging fruit, the complex care? Should I invest more? A better hospital. A better hospital if we had like a, a, a great pediatric hospital. Maybe we could avoid that they die, but they will still come. So maybe let's say, let's go out. Let's go for simple, effective interventions to the community. And maybe we would avoid that they get sick. And, but which one? What strategy? So I see as a as an expert on, on, on global pediatrics, I check what are the main causes of mortality uh, in children. And I see, oh, actually, almost 50% of deaths are newborns. OK, so actually, if I want to impact child mortality, let's focus on newborns. What are newborns dying from? OK, they're dying from asphyxia. They're dying from infections. And they're dying from complications of prematurity. These are the three leading causes. So if I actually are able to impact these three, because newborn deaths are the major component of under five deaths, then this is where I'm going to put my money. So let's think of strategies. So for birth asphyxia, we have all this program of helping babies breathe initiatives to try to improve the skills of the birth attendants at birth to reduce uh, asphyxia. And then for infections, all antibiotics simplify protocols for antibiotics, early detection of danger signs, early referral and treatment maybe cord care to prevent onphalitis. And then to prevent the complication of prematurity, we actually see that less than 10% of admissions to our newborn unit are children less than 1.5 kilos. We've seen that interventions for children below 1.5 kilos, and especially those below one kilo, the impact is very little and it's very expensive and they stay a lot. They, they use a lot of, of, bed, uh, of, of time, of bed occupancy. So unfortunately, because we see that it's such a small fraction, we should focus on newborns above one kilo or above 1.5 because there is where we see the best return in terms of, of a reduction of mortality. So we've come with this idea of kangaroo uh, care or skin to skin that actually is simple, it's relatively easy to scale up and it has proven to be effective. So it's very clear. But then we have the reality check that more than 50% of admissions of our, in our newborn units, were born at home. So already help babies breathe that tries to treat, sorry, to teach their provider to be better at birth. They, they don't know it. So the baby comes already with a sequela of asphyxia to your hospital. He didn't die. And he's coming already asphyxiated. So help babies breathe is nice, but it closed the eyes to the big problem. You do not address that it is not easy to, for the woman to access care. And in humanitarian settings, this is a big element, key element of humanitarian context. Access to healthcare is just not a matter of, uh, of a road. It's not just a matter of not having money for, 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 for the taxi. It is physical barriers for security, maybe an ethnic conflict, uh, maybe it could be clearly geographical distance. But access to healthcare is not something that you are going to change in a, in a place where they are at war. So help babies breed, don't address that problem. They, you still need to get and train the person. And if you're dealing with half of your deliveries are not getting to your facility, you have a problem. Then antibiotics. Antibiotics, you still also need to treat them. And in the global community, we refuse to treat newborns at home or to simplify the treatment. Most of the treatment for antibiotics for newborns are hospital-based, are injectable, so actually, it's very complicated to provide. They require a big length of stay, so they're not practical. And kangaroo mother care is also super nice in theory, and it works very much in, in many places, but it's extremely difficult to, it implies a behavioral change. change. You need to actually engage in a long-term approach uh, with the community so they accept that. And in terms of temperature, if you're in Niger in summer, 
uh, when it's 40, uh, I need to say it in, in, in your degrees, I don't know what 46 degrees is, but a lot, imagine a lot of degrees. Uh, it is very difficult to have a baby skin to skin to you 24 seven. So it is a nice approach, low hanging fruits, but they don't work very well. And they're not helping us. They help in some contexts, but they're not helping us in many others. Um, we don't have the resources to scale up and a clear approach where you see how limited we are in terms of our, of our capacity to provide and improve uh, or reduce mortality is, for example, nutrition programs. Let's say in a refugee setting. In a refugee setting, we know that we could have zero cases of malnutrition because in a refugee setting, you could control and provide good quality and quantity of food to your entire refugee population. And for those that, fall, that fell sick, you could have a clinic that treats them. So the best strategy would be to give good quality and quantity of food to the general population. But that's very expensive. So, okay, let's see, I don't have the money, but okay, let's at least target the pregnant woman and the children and maybe the elderly. Okay, but uh, that's also very expensive. There's a lot of women in this camp, there's a lot of children, and uh, they're gonna start complaining. So, okay, let's at least start with the malnourished. All the chronic malnutrition and the stunted and the wasted. Oh, there's, there's too many. There's like 5% of the population has some degree uh, of malnutrition, the, uh, of severe acute malnutrition, and the global uh, malnutrition rate of the, ten, of the setting is 15%. There are too many. Okay, so who do I choose? So I'm going to actually check who has the highest risk of mortality. And the highest risk of mortality comes with severe acute malnutrition where you're more than three Z scores below the normal range of weight for your height of a specific age. So you're really, really far away. So then we reduce to a small fraction of the population that we know have the highest risk of dying. And then as firefighters, I'm just going to treat these ones and then I'm going to treat them and then send them back to the community where they're going to come back maybe in six months. But that's what I can do as a humanitarian actor. Due to lack of resources, I'm going to focus on those with the highest risk of mortality. 90% of these children with severe acute malnutrition, I'm going to treat them uh, as outpatients. And around 10% of them are going to need to be hospitalized. That works in terms of mortality reduction, but I'm not at all addressing the underlying causes of, of, of the malnutrition in that setting. And it's a, that's extremely frustrating. After weeks of taking a child out of this acute phase to just send it back to the same place uh, with the same underlying conditions. And I think we need to change the frame because we're never, we're never gonna be able to find enough resources. We need to find a way where we could work with the community to understand at the same time what, that we are reducing the mortality of those with the highest risk, try to work to address some of the underlying problems that are causing this. Because it's not all the time lack of food. Maybe the problem is water and sanitation of bad quality that is causing a lot of disease and is actually an increase in the disease risk that is causing. And we could actually do something. If we only have the frame that severe acute malnutrition is due to lack of food, we would never solve this problem. Maybe it's a problem, an economical problem, that you have some people in the area that every year speculates on the price of corn or rice and start accumulating some of that and are causing an artificial increase of prices and people are starving. But it's not because there's a lack of food, there is actually a, a concentration of that. In some, and you, could you do something? Of course you could address that. So you need to go out of the frame and try to understand the economical dimension of a, of a, of a starvation situation. And then for some of you that could be interesting in the field of research to see how far we are, how far we are. These are two children with severe acute malnutrition. One is an edematous children. It is puffy. It accumulates fluid. It's called a quashiorcor. And the other one is completely wasted. It's the typical child that you see in all the magazines and that you see that was dying from starvation is marasmic. 2019, we would take a population and in the same situation of starvation, 
Some would develop one type of malnutrition and the other. And you don't need to be a specialist on malnutrition to understand that there's, there are two different conditions. And today we are treating him in the same way. In 2019, there are more treatments for erectile dysfunction than to treat children with quashork or, or marasmus. And that again, shame on humanity. We have no idea how to treat what cause quashork or no idea. And there are no treatments today. So we just treat them in the same, the same way, when we clearly know that it's not the same conditions. And it's occurring all the time. So part of the things that I do is in the field of, of, uh, of, uh, of nutrition, to try to bring on the key roles of uh, some elements. So this was some of the research that we did in the, in, for the role of uh, a key cofactor of the Krebs cycle, that is vitamin B1. And we tried to do a critical review of literature, because for some of what we thought, B1 would be an excellent, excellent element to be actually put in a randomized controlled trial in patients with shock, and some with a B1 and some without, and actually would, we would give us a hypothesis that we would reduce uh, mortality in shock, even in high resource settings. What is the interest of the pharma industry to do this? Zero, because you can buy a B1 for almost nothing. So there's just no money. And this is another reality of the field and why I'm, I'm realistic. I'm not going to change the economical situation of the world. So I know why there is no treatment for this. There is no money involved in improving this. There is no money to teach us what would be the quantity of some key micronutrients to actually reduce the risk of refeeding syndrome, reduce the risk of shock. There are no, not enough uh, uh, economical incentive to actually do that. So there needs to be broader initiatives from key academic institutions, humanitarian actors, and key economical actors and companies that are willing to put themselves under an umbrella to actually perform key research in some areas. So when my daughter is going to be 18, I hope that there is more treatments for these children and that doctors, the new generation of caretakers that are going to humanitarian settings, don't continue to treat these children as if we were in the 1950s, because I think it's a disgrace. Um, another element that has improved, at least on the positive note, has been some uh, advent of, of uh, better communication and technology. So in, uh, in MSF, in Doctors Without Borders, we have a telemedicine platform. So every field that has a very, very basic uh, power supply that have access to the most narrow band internet connection, they can enter to a platform that is encrypted, safe, it protects the confidentiality of the data of the patient. It's very, very basic, and they are allowed to send text description of the case if they have images or videos. And then we have a platform that runs 24-7 with medical coordinators and around um, uh, 500 specialists. And then we can have a direct advice to them on some areas on pediatric oncology, dermatology, um, uh, critical care. Uh, and it has, changed, it has changed the perspective of how we do. When I did my first uh, mission in Africa, the, the first time I managed to send a case, I got a reply five days later telling me what to do when my patient had already died. Now we're giving an advice in around five hours maximum. So it's quite, it's quite good. Even in, in specialized settings, sometimes you don't get the specialist to reply to you in less than five hours. And it's also reducing the perception of uh, isolation that some of our teams have. And also it reduced the dependence on the white expatriate that is the one that normally was there. So the communication can be uh, between pairs in the same country. So a clinical officer from South Sudan uh, in Northern placed with another colleague that are seeing similar conditions, or it could be uh, with a university setting and a direct discussion of the case. 
and that was an element that, uh, that helped me. Uh, this is a, a little baby with a, a mass in the eye in Sierra Leone. So the field team sent this case thinking that it was uh, a tumor uh, of the eye. And the question was, is it, is it benign or, uh, or not? Is it a cancer? Should we do a surgery? Uh, so I don't know if we have any ophthalmology colleagues here. But even when I saw it quickly, and then I saw the discussion, I was like, yeah, maybe it seems like a, a, a cyst, maybe it's a benign mass. But actually, the ophthalmologist saw the case and immediately reply, look for some tape, duct tape, and then place it on the eyelid and just turn it. It's just the eyelid that is averted. Uh, so that is common when you have neonatal uh, infection. So that's something that, that is not common here. But just with some tape, they solve the problem in five seconds. But nobody in the local team in that moment thought of it. And now that you know that it's the eyelid, then you sit and say, OK, yeah, maybe it was the eyelid. But in that moment, not even the, the clinical coordinator, which was an emergency physician, nobody thought of it. Because the eyes don't see what the mind don't know. You just don't think of it. So it has been very, very useful to just think that sometimes you just need somebody else's perspective to maybe see the obvious, but it was just there. And it was very helpful to know. And another thing that I'm, that I'm working on was uh, on the field of the effects of climate change slash global warming uh, and uh, child health. And historically, this is some of the models that we saw. A linear model where you have the child as the recipient of external elements that were impacting it, and the children that was just uh, the victim of all of these elements. Uh, and you have to act in the mitigation and elements to try to impact. But it was, it was very much, the child was almost an object in this model. So that was the model that I worked on. Uh, that is, I'm not going to ex explain it here. But it was applying complex thinking framing into the field of climate change and child health. And in my model, my our perspective with my co-authors was that extreme weather events not all the time cause trauma. There are many children that we've seen exposed to disasters that actually thrive after it. What are the elements? And that is the importance that we start to learn. It's not only about, uh, about um, the type of event, but we've seen that there's some underlying conditions of that child age, physical, mental status, its family, its close circle, the way they interact, and the community, that clearly makes the difference between a child that is going to have a big post-traumatic stress disorder after an event and one that is actually uh, going to become a chess champion. I don't know if you followed that story in the New York Times of a, of a little child that has become a chess champion. He's a refugee, and the guy is a national champion here. And it seems that he's, he's thriving into that. And so I try to see children not as these vulnerable, fragile creatures, but actually thinking of models that actually orthopedists know that a, a bone in a child actually heals up to six to 10 times faster than in an adult. In the same sense, they are able to adapt faster. So with the good elements that you could provide to these children, they could actually thrive facing adversity. Uh, and that is an interesting element that adults, we should learn to see how we could actually adapt. Because what I'm talking here seems that it's far away. Disasters, humanitarian crises are far away. No, my friends, they could happen anytime here. We saw it uh, with Katrina. We've seen it with the flood here in the United States. I've seen it in Mexico City with earthquakes. Uh, actually, our office of Doctors Without Borders in Mexico City couldn't function in the first 48 hours because our office was affected. So we had to actually adapt and quickly be able to respond. So a partial collapse of services could occur tomorrow here. And by understanding what are the underlying elements that make us stronger, any of us here could learn 
So it, it's not something that you would learn only if you actually have to go into war zones in Yemen or Syria or Somalia. These are elements that could help us, any of us as humans, to be more resilient and to learn to adapt if by any chance we happen to be in a situation where we're lacking access to basic services. And we'll see that actually, for example, one of the big programs of resilience building in Japan uh, for reducing mental health effects in children after earthquakes or tsunamis were actually put mandatory swimming lessons for all children. So learning how to swim is a basic element of the national program of education. But it's actually, so it's physical resilience. If you know how to swim, you're going to be less prone of dying out of drowning. But it also helps feel you more secure in yourself, in your capacity. So it actually has an impact even in the face of that is not actually a flooding. Even in the face of a disaster of a different type, children are more resilient. So it's an interesting element of their program where they're trying to build resilience and it has an impact when massive um, geolog geological events happen to that. So again, in my perception, children are not these vulnerable creatures. They have a lot of elements that we need to understand and then we can extrapolate that, that knowledge uh, into our other perspective and we can even use it in non-disaster situation. In another way of what I see, disaster preparedness. Disaster preparedness, not only to just be ready to intervene, but actually be ready to understand the underlying conditions that are causing a high risk of a disaster and prevent it before it, it occurs. Not just be ready to send uh, rescue teams. So part of this is to tell you that we need to frame and build this new field of humanitarian medicine and this particular specialty of humanitarian pediatrics because there's a lot of work to do. We need people like you to engage at whatever stage of where you are and whatever profession you are into trying to join and understand that there is still work to do. Maybe encourage some of the people that you work with into pursuing professional careers into this field. This is not just to do an interesting field placement in another like humanitarian tourism. There's actually things to develop and to learn and bring it to the larger uh, global community. So we need to standardize some of these approaches because it's actually in an emergency context it's actually easier to move them. We talk a lot in public health of mother and child health uh, as, a, as an entity, but we need to take it operationally as a strategy. It's not the same just saying, yeah, mother and children, they need to be together. When you're actually trying to build interventions that are addressing mother and children, you need to try to come with operational elements to actually be able to provide something concretely. Uh, it just doesn't work just to say that they need to be together. There needs to be concrete elements. For example, uh, many guidelines or tools that describe how to build a maternity in a humanitarian context don't put space for newborn. So if you don't have the space for newborn, uh, you can keep them, but if you don't have staff to take care of the newborn, you don't count them, it's going to be much harder to try to keep them together. You have not thought really that, uh, that they are patients too. Quality of care, you hear a lot of these buzzwords like we're trying to make simple, adapted, cost-effective intervention, but the element of the humanitarian setting is feasibility, operational feasibility. Is that approach that you know, for example, on neonatal tetanus? Neonatal tetanus, we know that actually if we vaccinate all women of reproductive age, all the population, that's it, you don't have neonatal tetanus. But in some of our settings, we published uh, last year a cohort of 120 cases just in one project. We had a neonatal, neonatal tetanus ward. And my job has been to write an, a guide, an algorithm to how to treat neonatal tetanus. And it's extremely frustrating. How, writing a guideline on how to treat neonatal tetanus in 2018, that is a disease that should just not exist. And the treatments are from 100 years ago. So, the, but the solutions, when I start reading about the interventions, yeah, yeah, vaccinate everybody. I'm like, yeah, but there are conflicts, women are not coming, uh, I don't have the money to reach all the population. Give me better strategies 
from this perspective of lack of access, security constraints, to be able to target which women should I target if I cannot vaccinate the entire population? How many times should I vaccinate them? And what are the strategies that I could have to reach them in a setting where access and security are a problem? So don't tell me I need to vaccinate everybody. I can't do that. I'm going to still see neonatal tetanus. How do I prevent that from happening? And also the other part, I need better treatment for neonatal tetanus. So I need people that actually think that finding new molecules to treat neonatal tetanus today are, is important, even if there is no economical incentive. In the US, there was just recently one case, and it costed like almost a million dollars to treat that child. Uh, but that's now no market to, to pharma. Then decentralization. Yes, that's the low hanging fruit. We would like the closer you are to the patient, the closer to the community, that's what we learn in public health. That's the most cost effective. But decentralization comes with a problem, a geographical problem. So try to decentralize care in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The more you decentralize, or northern Nigeria, and then you are with Boko Haram, and then we're like, instead of one area, you have 15,000 communities separated, and you don't have access. So decentralization needs to come with the element of feasibility and resources. Uh, capitalization, that's the other part that we are bad in the humanitarian settings and we need to link with the academic community. Most of these areas, it comes with the ethical dilemma. Should we do research in a humanitarian context? Should I engage with people that are like victims of cholera, victims of Ebola, and when they're completely unable to process, ask them to sign a consent to actually be part of a randomized controlled trial? It's not easy. But on the other hand, if we don't document that, then we don't build the evidence to actually be able to change the dynamics. So I don't know where is the balance, but we need help to be able to do better reports and operational research. So what happens in the field of humanitarian medicine is we publish a lot of uh, our experience, our perspective, our model, and then we go to the big medical community and they tell, oh, but that's not the best evidence. That's not a randomized controlled trial. Where's your p-values? That doesn't work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, to get a p-value and to randomize treatment in the middle of, uh, of uh, northern Nigeria or Somalia, it's very difficult. Yeah, but your evidence is not the best evidence. So I don't need it. I'm not going to use that vitamin. It's, it has not been proven. So we have paradox. Let me tell you something that is very clear. In Yemen, in, Yemen, in the last uh, 50 years, there have been a big switch of the culture. Women that used to be uncovered are now completely covered. They're completely covered, and what is the first thing? So they're not exposed anymore now to the sun. So any physician or public health specialist or nutritionist know that what happens when you're not exposed to the sun? You don't get enough vitamin D. That's it, no brainer. So we have massive cohorts <laughs> of rickets, which is vitamin D deficiency, in Yemen. We published a cohort of almost 600 patients in just one setting in Yemen. But that's the tip of the iceberg. Almost everybody, know, we know that they're deficient in vitamin D. And then we say, okay, we should supplement the pregnant women with vitamin D. And then we go for the evidence. And actually, what is published is that, you know what, and it's just recently a publication, vitamin D supplementation in pregnant women has not been shown to prove a reduction of outcomes in the children, uh, increase their weight or reduce mortality. That's the best evidence that we have. So when policymakers want to push for vitamin D supplementation in Yemen for pregnant women, they're like, oh, you know, best evidence. It says that it doesn't work. Yeah, but that evidence was not built in Yemen population. It doesn't take into account. Yeah, but that's best evidence. So are you going to go against best evidence? That's best evidence. That's the best evidence. So. You come with your practice. That was what we did 100 years ago. Your experience, your practice. So you're going to challenge best evidence. So we can't change that. WHO doesn't change their recommendation on vitamin D supplementation. It just said, consider it in high risk areas. But how much, for how long, who to target? We don't have that element. And this is the problem of basing everything on best evidence today. And then we need new strategies, technologies, solutions. So I don't put the element on just high tech. 
Sometimes the tools can be a better vital science chart. Some, some of the more simple research that I do is implementation of pediatric early warning systems that actually are very cost effective in areas with re resource limited, uh, where resources are limited. Uh, we need to improve, we need to simplify, but the other element is, it is what I'm doing here, we need to advocate. We need to do a big work of advocacy to try to improve the treatment for some of these complex conditions, some of these neglected conditions, because today there's not going to be an automatic incentive for some of these uh, conditions to be um, actually studied or to find new, new solutions. One element of this has been in the field of vaccines. One of the big revolutions coming in the field of vaccines are nano patches. So you have patches that you put in the skin, and these nano patches are an extremely well uh, process of delivering vaccines. It's going to revolutionize the, the field of vaccines. To develop the nano patch, it takes sometimes up to 20 years the process for the vaccine. So what we've, saw, what we've seen with the new uh, companies that are building the nano patches, we've seen their list of the vaccines in the pipeline. Of course, measles is not there. Of course, uh, cholera is not there. The vaccines that today are killing children are not in their top priorities. So if we don't advocate to put them in the list, they're never, they're never gonna be there. And but somebody needs to pay them. I well, we need to be realistic. They're gonna invest for 20 years on the development of something new. There needs to be a market. So there needs to be somebody that is gonna help the local national governments of all these countries that are affected by measles to actually buy that vaccine. So these industries actually see that, okay, there's a market and therefore I can actually develop the measles nano patch and not put it in the priority number 20 in my list. So you need to, to also understand these economical elements. And don't be afraid to innovate. I don't talk here about experimentation, about something unethical, but in this field of humanitarian action, sometimes you need to think out of the box because the public health, global health solutions are just not applicable. So you're gonna have to think of something else. You're gonna have to go out of, of your comfort zone and say, best evidence tells me that I should not work with traditional bird attendants because they're dangerous. That's what best evidence tells me. But that's it, this is where women are delivering their kids. So I just stay with best evidence and I do nothing, or I could actually approach them and actually engage with them to at least improve the, the, the health of the newborn. And actually what we've seen when we do that is actually women start to be referred at higher proportions to the health center. But we are afraid sometimes of going out of our comfort zone. And um, a broader perspective, so the field I talked, I talked a lot about health, but the, the field of, of humanitarian pediatrics is much broader, of course. So I am completely biased because of my area of work. So there's a broader field of education, of child protection and child care, welfare, early stimulation, integration, mental health. And that is the other initiative. Because of my frustration with dealing with this never ending problem where we don't seem to be changing the, the status quo, uh, for the past uh, three years I've been working creating a small organization working in education in emergencies. Because another thing that I want to break is this idea that education comes later. In most of the places that I've been, there are just no schools. In, the, in West Africa, when there was the Ebola outbreak in some areas, schools were closed for two years. And that has a big impact. And some of my work, I, 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 I treat, I don't save, uh, use the word saving again, but I treat children with malnutrition, trying to protect their brains. So very important to treat the children with severe acute malnutrition, because I know that if that brain is not protected by age two, they must be, they could be a permanent brain damage. But then, without stimulation, without education, that brain is still as vulnerable and fragile as when there were no nutrients. So we cannot just put one leg to the chair if you don't put the other one. So I am convinced that there needs to be the same effort on education in disaster and humanitarian settings. The problem is that it's much harder to sell education. It's much, much sexier to talk about dying children than children that cannot go to school. And that's a reality. 
is that when we are doing fundraising, most of the big organizations, dying population seems to be a macro element that drives a lot of empathy or sympathy or charity towards our organizations. And I would like that we are able to understand that we should be able to participate. If you want to participate, this is as important to work uh, in the field of education. Uh, and last point is that I would like to invite all of you that are interested in to this to join the streaming of a global conference that we're going to do in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, 5 and 6 of April. We're going to have, it's going to be live stream, it's for free. You just need to register on the website. You don't see it well, but it's pediatrics.msf.org, but it's pediatrics written on the, on the British way. Uh, and, uh, and you're going to see some of the actual real examples of operational research that are done in this field. For many years, we did the country. We went to all the other platforms of research in the world of pediatrics, trying to tell them, hey, let me show you what we're doing here. Let me tell you what, we're showing, what we need here. And we saw that they had just a different perspective. So we're trying to build a platform. So it was created by MSF, but it's not exclusive. We have the presence of Save the Children, we have the presence of Alima, we have the presence of WHO, of UNICEF, of other global actors that come together and try to define what are the priorities that we could do to improve the field of humanitarian pediatrics. Understanding that today we have, we, we're in a nice time where we're actually starting to see uh, the improvement at a global scale and we should not keep these areas of, of, of the humanitarian context completely outside of these benefits. We can actually reduce drastically mortality in our settings if we just change our framework, if we just think out of the box. And we remember of this element that I told you at the beginning, a little bit philosophical, to remember this direct contact from human to human. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget that we, right now we are the privileged. By whatever settings, we were born in the right place. I was born on the other side of the border. So maybe it's not going to be a, a nice place soon. But uh, this is, we need to understand that that was the only determinant that today, the more important determinant of health is where you're born. That's it. It's not how cute you are or how clever you are. And we need to remember that and not come from this perspective that uh, we are better or that I'm going to take care first of my own. We are all the same. I learned that very quickly the first time I was in Niger. They were exactly the same. The needs of the children that I saw were exactly the same I saw in Mexico and in France. They were exactly the same. There were just no difference. It, the only difference was my incapacity to understand their local language, uh, which was a challenge. But in terms of them as human beings, and, and also the other difference is that I was called the white doctor. That was, <laughs> that was very interesting uh, change of perspective. Uh, but except for that, it was exactly the same. So it was a big revelation about the similarities that we all have and, and has changed my way of seeing the world, has changed the day that I perceive I try to at least have a sense of what I'm trying to do. It doesn't mean that what I do uh, is helpful. Sometimes I've received some comments about, about uh, that, it, that this is useless or that it doesn't change or that, uh, that we're contributing to the increase of the, of the, of the population. But I, I'm trying to not enter into that uh, analysis of very cynical perspective. I think that what I have in front of me, wherever I am, is another human being if they are actually in that moment requesting for help and I have in my capacity something that I can do, I'm going to try. And most of this time, I actually learn a lot. So uh, that's what I wanted to say today. And I thank you very much for your time and your patience. And we have time for a few questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I home tonight. So it's <laughs> <laughs> Folks, uh, any questions people would like to ask? I see one in the back.
Yes, my colleague from Nigeria. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gashia. One of the biggest issues I noted from your lecture is access. Yeah. How have you been addressing that in the communities you've been working? Then, tied to that, is I didn't see much about collaboration and partnerships. It's obviously almost impossible to implement an intervention in a community without collaboration, especially in places you have mentioned, like Niger, not in some part of Nigeria. Yeah. How have you been addressing uh, these issues of poverty? Thank you. Yeah, so access. I think realistically, geographical, let's say that you manage to rebuild a bridge or get access, but bring things through plane. But that is the easy, low hanging fruit. The hardest is to engage with the local actors. So in Northern Nigeria, it has implied discussions from us with Boko Haram and the Nigerian army to be granted space. But some that, something that happened just last year was an attack in the city of Ran where the Nigerian army bombarded a setting where we were. Uh, so it's not easy. It's not easy, even in places where we are. So, and that gives us access to one city, but that doesn't give us access directly to the front line of, of the action. So we are not uh, cowboys that are... Got, so, for example, in exactly in Nigeria, the front line of the conflict between Boko Haram and or the Nigerian army or Iraq, where there was the front line between ISIS and the Iraqi U.S. Army, when it's acute, acute, we, we just can't. We, are not, we don't have the preconditions to be there. <coughs> we try, but the risk that we expose ourselves is too high. So right now, we, the benefit would be to maybe get some access to some few uh, wounded. So we try to establish a baseline where we have uh, that security. But for example, in terms of access, what we can do in northern Nigeria are just one-time clinics. So we cannot provide seven to seven services. We do one time, we do clinics that last for maybe four to seven days and we enter every two to three weeks. So the first wave we come and we do vaccination of this. We go out. Then we come back and we do vaccination of another antigen and we do, for example, antiparasitic treatment and then we do one consultation of antenatal care, then we will go back. Then we come back again in three weeks and we do something else. Extremely inefficient in terms of cost effectiveness, it could be considered low. But what we're trying to grant is to, per, to, to get this limited access. But we cannot be actors of, of, of the conflict. So the access in most of these places are given by the arm, armed actors. To your second question, I agree. Uh, MSF has not been the best um, uh, student, and uh, some of my colleagues of MSF watching would not agree that I say that. But we're not going to be, we haven't been the best organization in terms of collaboration. We have really believed in our independence. So many times we don't collaborate. We think that we're better than others and that we know better. So part of this speech is to acknowledge that we're not better than others. We don't know better. The challenges are so high that we need any other uh, help, professional help. So we have to collaborate. So the Patrick Days is, a, is an initiative. MSF has been doing scientific events for years. This is one of the few times that we're reaching brother. We can't alone. Ebola is one example. MSF kept most of the knowledge, the technical knowledge on how to treat patients with Ebola for many years because there were small outbreaks. That was very good for us because we were the best. We were trained. But then when the West Africa epidemic occurred, completely out of control. Nobody else knew. And we didn't have the capacity to train everybody. So we saw the limits of that setting where we had kept all the knowledge. It is not helpful. It is not helpful today that we remain one of the key actors that know how to treat Ebola. So today, we welcome and we train other organizations. For cholera, the same. There is no, nothing gained by being the exclusive owners of anything. We don't gain. So we need to get our uh, ego, collective egos away and learn how to collaborate as long as it doesn't compromise our capacity to intervene in one area or the other. I hope it answered your question. Yes. Thanks, Doctor. Um, 
Don't, don't, don't call me a doctor. Me. Daniel is fine. Well, anyway, thank you. Um, what I'm really interested in is how do you deal with it? You've got a best practice that's culturally not matching the people who you're serving, especially in a crisis situation. I'll just give a good example. Male circumcision to prevent HIV. Oh, something you could easily do as a child. Are you going to fight those barriers then? I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, and that, that is, let's say, a controversial topic because male circumcision, uh, for example, if you go and put it into Kenya, male circumcision has been used as a weapon of war against males in Kenya. Uh, so I don't remove the elements that it is a public health intervention that has been linked to reducing HIV, but it's a proxy. You could have worked by increasing hygiene of other elements. Uh, so that's why that one I don't like, but there are others. So it is true that in some settings, for example, palliative care. Palliative care in a place like Afghanistan. Palliative care in Afghanistan is culturally completely unacceptable because medicine is supposed to be uh, for curative care. The law says that any act of medicine should be for curing or with the aim of curing the patient. And the religion says that actually the doctor is there to cure and accompany the patient on to healing. So palliative care comes from a different approach and we try to implement it because we know that it improves the quality of care of the patient, disregarding if they're dying or not. It hasn't, been able, it hasn't been easy to introduce it there. It hasn't been easy to introduce it in a setting where you, where you have to change a, 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 a local belief. And also, let me tell you also that we come with one occidental perspective of what is supposed to be better for others. And it's not always easy to put the limit of why should we change something. Uh, who tells you, kangaroo mother care, for example. Uh, or for example, when I went to North Korea, they actually do acupuncture plus antibiotics for appendicitis. Here, this would be malpractice. <laughs> but, and I debated a lot, who, who am I to say to them that that's wrong? So in one sense, I was like, okay, but you cannot just accept anything, for example, uh, let's say the other one, female genital mutilation. Should, should I say it because that's culturally the practice, should I just say that's the culture and just I accept it? And it's complicated. Even male uh, circumcision in some settings. In some others it could be considered mutilation. So I, I don't have an answer. I just say that in some you need, um, uh, you need to understand the culture but not acculturate your practice. Just not accept anything just because it is the local culture. And also at the same time, not reject anything that is traditional because it is just out of your medical practice and consider it baseline harmful just because you don't understand it. Acceptability. You have. Uh, you want to help the community. You have uh, the resources, but you still realize that these people uh, they are not accepting what you are offering. How do you try to overcome such things? Then another question is about uh, the political will. Uh, what are the challenges that we face in concerning? Okay, so the f you, excellent question. The first one, if you follow that, I, I think uh, I've discussed with some of you about um, the current Ebola outbreak in Congo. The current Ebola outbreak in DRC, East Congo, right now is being the second largest outbreak in history, more than a thousand cases. And we have a problem there because now we have new treatments, we have the vaccine, we have a better response capacity. So contrary to West Africa epidemic, now we have WHO and at least a dozen organizations acting. But we didn't do did our work well. So we spent a lot of time organizing among each other internally and with other actors to say who was going to do what, who was going to do which vaccine and who was going to, to use what treatment. 
And what has happened in the recent weeks is that we were attacked. Our Ebola treatment centers were uh, burned and attacked by local militias. And we could say it's unacceptable that they accept, but we could also think, why were we not able to gain the acceptance of that community? Because we spent so much effort just agreeing on the broader intervention, on stopping this epidemic, on treating the people like biological threats, that we did not spend enough time working with these local communities. And I tell you because I've been in Congo many times, and I know that before we used to do that effort. We know that for, to build that humanitarian space, it just doesn't happen. We just don't arrive and we tell to Boko Haram or ISIS, this is the humanitarian law, then respect us. No, no, no. They need to trust us. They need to understand what we're doing. They need to see the clear. They need to see that we are trustable people. That work needs to also, for the community, needs to see what we're doing. For Ebola, you need to see what we're doing. What are we doing with the patients? How are we dealing with corpses when they die? Are we respecting? the local practices on how to deal with a body in the safest way. We didn't do that work. And we lost access, and then they attacked us. So we need to ensure that acceptability is, it is the baseline. It should be the baseline. You cannot be, as I am in Geneva or here, and plan your strategy for an intervention right now for the floods in Mozambique or for the war in Yemen without actually being discussing with the actually key stakeholders at ground level. If you're just there, you, just, you, are, you have so many degrees of distance, you're going to fail. And then we're going to be in the situation that we are in northern Nigeria. We don't have access. And then we innovate. Let's think on the baseline. If you actually discuss and prove your added value, we are magically granted access. And security becomes less of an issue. And to the second one is about political uh, willingness. That's not easy, you know, like, that, I struggle sometimes, and you have governments that are, that uh, actually, many of the humanitarian crises were caused by local governments. And they actually instrumentalize humanitarian help. And they actually benefit from this massive population displacement. Maybe it's a, an ethnic group or a political group that they don't like. So there is no political will there. So, it's not easy. We need to engage with those authorities, but we also need to know what is happening and that humanitarian aid is instrumentalized very easily. So we need to also be careful when we see that, uh, especially a massive displacement of population that has happened, for example, in Central African Republic or that happened in Rwanda in the 90s. The specific local governments were causing these, these disasters. So when we discuss with them, we need to also be very careful about about how really um, sincere they are in their actions. Maybe they are very happy that all this population is displaced and now you, they're gonna grant you access so you treat them. Now that we managed to free this area, now we can occupy this area that was used by, the, by this population. What happened with the Rohingya population, in, uh, for example, in Myanmar, or what has happened with Somali population in Ethiopia, the government, have an interest in forcing the massive displacement of the population to occupy that, and then they grant you access. Yeah, now actually I have a lot of refugees here. Come, treat them, give them water and sanitation. You need to not be naive on that political dimension, not, not you, huh? like us as, as a community uh, about uh, what is happening and, and how much you can engage onto that. I don't know if it answers the second question. Yeah, re remember that I'm from Mexico and I have to cross the border with a passport full of weird stamps. <laughs> and I always have to explain if I'm where I'm from. Well, here, this, this one will help you explain what you're doing. This is a, a plaque awarding you the title of honorary professor in the College of Public Oh, Health. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Wow. This is this is very nice. Thank you very much. We don't have another Leading Voices scheduled, but I hope to have one uh, sent out in the next couple of weeks. But thank you all for being here. That's very nice. Yeah, thank you very much. You shouldn't have.